you, comrades, for allowing me to speak. Uh, this bulk of this presentation was actually written by uh, a comrade from Glasgow, Joe Finn. Uh, he provided an excellent look at uh, Churchill's attitudes and policies and actions, uh, largely towards the working class in Britain, which are, of course, hugely glossed over in present-day accounts of him. Uh, British imperialist propaganda has created the myth that Churchill was the foremost fighter against fascism, that he was a defender of freedoms and the people brutalised and put into concentration camps at the hands of the Nazi regime. The truth, however, is that he was a racist, rabid, anti-communist reactionary with considerable sympathies for fascism. Indeed, it was not only his outlook that was similar to fascism, but the actual impact of his policies and the British Empire were equally, if not more horrific, than that of Hitler and Mussolini. His main concern was the defence of the British Empire. Circumstances forced him to align, albeit insincerely and half-heartedly, with the Soviet Union in the war against Hitler on Germany. From before the beginning of the war, Churchill and the imperialists actually saw Nazi Germany as a bastion against the Soviet Union, and throughout the war hoped that one of the outcomes would be the destruction of this socialist state. This attitude led to the deaths of many millions of people, as the Allies were reluctant to fully assist in the war effort until it became clear that the Soviet Union would reach Berlin before the Allies. And the idea of any more of Europe becoming socialist due to the influence of the Red Army was simply abhorrent to them. At the Tehran Conference in 1943, Churchill had told Stalin and Roosevelt that history would be kind to him as he would write that history. Indeed, he was, throughout much of his life, a journalist um, as well as a politician and soldier. Between both world wars, he had gained experience on this front. Whilst being a politician, he made his living off writing, as MPs were not paid uh, when he came into position. As a paid writer of the bourgeoisie, he created a powerful myth around himself. History has indeed been kind to Churchill, his name being more revered today than in his lifetime, when in fact he was a deeply unpopular figure, especially with the working classes. In 2002, he topped a BBC poll as the greatest Briton. In the long history of Great Britain, no scientist, thinker, politician or cultural icon could come close to Churchill's status as a national treasure. We must challenge such absurd conceptions of Churchill. If we look at his key actions and attitudes, with specific attention paid to these questions of social class, race, empire and war, it will be shown that Churchill was no far-sighted anti-fascist, and that he failed in his own terms many times over. His views on empire and race were not so far removed from the fascists he made his name seemingly opposing and then defeating. Finally, as the greatest Briton, he was a man with the hatred for the vast majority of Britain, and, well, excuse me, and the majority of Britons. Such were his views on the working class. <coughs> it's important to give some context to his life, <coughs> as events earlier in his life shed an element of light on the character of man and provide some added insight when analysing later events. With that in mind, it's worth revisiting the 10th of January, 1893. At that time, Churchill enrolled in Sandhurst, the military academy, for our officer class, so largely taking its ranks from the bourgeoisie and the aristocracy, uh, which it still does to this day, injured himself at Sandhurst playing war games. In true Churchill fashion, he resorted to lies, desperately anxious to glamorise what happened. Though he had suffered only minor injuries, he could not cl resist claiming that he had ruptured a kidney and remained unconscious for three days. <laughs> had this actually happened, internal bleeding would have probably killed him within the hour. His own father grew weary of his son's bouts of fantasy. This occasion proved to be a tipping point, and the father wrote in a letter to Winston, I no longer attach the slightest weight to anything you may say about your own exploits. <laughs> that was his own dad. <laughs> I've had that letter. <laughs> <laughs> Having failed twice in his exams at Sandhurst, he was sent to the elite school of Captain Walter H. James. He had the use of a private military tutor as a result of his failures to pass without special help. The captain had this to say of Churchill. <clears throat> 
He is distinctly inclined to be inattentive and think too much of his own abilities. <laughs> what this little piece of scene setting shows is that Churchill was an unreliable witness. This was particularly true of events involving himself. He was quite unable and or unwilling to provide any degree of impartiality in matters involving himself. It is not surprising that the son of an aristocrat was given such flights of fancy and grandiose self-importance. Keen to see military action, he went to Cuba to observe the War of Independence and actually joined in with Spanish troops who were pressing the liberation fighters. He then later used his mother's influence to join the 4th Hussars of the British Army as a second lieutenant and was posted to India. He tried to join Kitchener's campaign in the Sudan and again he had to use his aristocratic influence to achieve this as Kitchener thought he was merely seeking publicity and medals. I have a suspicion Kitchener was quite right. When he returned to England, he embarked on a political career, unsuccessfully as running as a Conservative in two elections and finally winning a seat on his third attempt in 1900. But by 1904, he had crossed the floor to the Liberal Party, where he remained until 1924 when he returned to the Conservatives. Leading up to and during his time in the Liberals, he supported many progressive reforms, an eight-hour workday for minors, opposed anti-immigration bills, the enforcement of the minimum wage, breaks for workers, and assistance in finding work, and unemployment insurance. He did so not because he liked the working class, but because Liberals often have to play a conciliatory role in class struggle in order to maintain the system of capitalism. The bourgeoisie would, if unrestrained by the bourgeois state, actually threaten to collapse the capitalist system by its increasing drive to squeeze greater and greater profits from the working class. And we can see from many of his later positions and statements that his political opportunism knew no bounds. And I'm going to talk now a little bit about um, Churchill's views on race and his racism. <laughs> it's, it's not just to point out that Churchill was a deeply unpleasant chap. Um, but it shed some light on you know, his considerations of opposing uh, this anti-immigration bill, the anti-immigration bill of 1905, known as the Aliens Act, uh, which was largely to suppress um, Jewish immigrants coming from Eastern Europe and Russia who were fleeing pogroms and extremely reactionary and oppressive uh, governments and local bands. And he argued for this act, not because he had any great love of the Jewish people, as we'll see later on from his uh, position on Jewish people and Zionism, but because as a liberal he knew that capitalism needed the free movement of labour in order to function. And indeed all of his uh, progressive reforms were of this liberal idea, that to protect the free market you need to protect uh, freedom of movement, you need to protect um, certain rights of workers, but especially rights of uh, companies and the labour force in order to maintain that system. <coughs> so his views were not out of line at all with the bourgeoisie on these issues, although it saw him um, disliked by the Conservatives of the time, which is why he moved to the Liberal Party. You know, his views were absolutely not out of line with you know, a large section of the bourgeoisie that supported liberalism and free trade. And so when we come to the issue of race, it's safe to say that Churchill held some robust views. He saw society as a racial hierarchy. As a white Protestant himself, white Protestants rested at the top of that hierarchy. He thought less of Catholics, even less of brown people, and of black people, even less again. Whilst history is indeed written by the victor, and has been kind to Churchill, the reality is that our supposed saviour from fascism held views not so dissimilar to those of the Nazis. Bourgeois historians attempt to absolve Churchill's clear racism. For them, he was a man of his time and a man of his class. To expect anything else is to think anachronistically. A typically weak defence is given by Richard Holmes, who argues that by, church, uh, by race, Churchill simply meant culture, and that critics are guilty of selective quoting. Furthermore, he claims that it was only in response to Nazism that a change of vocabulary emerged. Finally, contradictorily, he asserts that Churchill may have been prejudiced, but he was not a bigot. I'm not sure how you 
quite separate those two. Such arguments fall down in multiple ways. Firstly, as the historian Richard Toy has said, we are being asked to believe two contradictory things simultaneously. On the one hand, it is suggested that the seemingly unpleasant aspects of his racial thinking can be excused on the grounds that he could not have been expected to escape from mentality prevailing during his youth. On the other hand, we are told that he did escape it, and it's to be praised because he was actually unusually enlightened. So he was at once stuck in the thinking of his time and class, and that excuses uh, you know, his thoughts and actions. And on the other hand, he's praised because he was actually unusually enlightened. I think you have to pick one there, you can't have it both ways. <laughs> Progressives of this time certainly did not share his views on race or what Holmes calls culture. To find such an example, one only needs to read Stalin's writing on the national question to see that progressive politics did exist at the time. For instance, Stalin pointed out that national and racial chauvinism were a vestige of the misanthropic customs characteristic of the period of cannibalism. The one truth revealed in the general defence made by this bourgeois historian is that Churchill was indeed a man of his class, and Stalin a man of his flat matter. With all the sophistry typical of Churchill, he was clearly not adverse to the Goebbelsian big lie. For example, in the words of this racist Prime Minister, Stalin and the Soviet armies are developing the same prejudices against the chosen people as are so painfully evident in Germany. In fact, the reality of the situation is much different. Communists, as consistent internationalists, cannot but be irreconcilable sworn enemies of anti-Semitism. In the USSR, anti-Semitism was punishable with the utmost severity of the law as a phenomenon deeply hostile to the Soviet system. Under Soviet law, active anti-Semites, that is, people espousing or distributing or agitating for anti-Semitism, could face the death penalty. Any school history student would struggle to tell the difference, however, between a Churchill or Hitler quote. With history having been so kind, who would expect the world's seemingly saviour of such atrocious words? Keep insert country white is a good slogan. Of course, these are the words of Winston Churchill, not Adolf Hitler. The country is England, not Germany. Similarly, the following is not an abstract from Mein Kampf, but the words of Winston Churchill. The Aryan stock is bound to triumph. <laughs> Churchill's own Secretary of State for India, Leopold Amory, revealed in his private diaries that on the subject of India, Winston is not quite sane. I do not see much difference between Churchill's outlook and Hitler's. In common with Hitler, he considered genocide could be justifiable, if not an outright imperative. Post-World War II, he may have presented himself as the saviour of the Jewish people, but to him, ethnic cleansing and annihilation were far from objectable. To the Palestine Royal Commission in 1937, he made this crystal clear. He said, I do not admit that a great wrong has been done to the Red Indians of America or to the black people of Australia by the fact that a stronger race, a higher grade race, has come in and taken its place. Mm -hmm. Writing in the Strand magazine, he said, I cannot pretend to be impartial about the colours. I rejoice with the brilliant ones and I'm genuinely sorry for the poor browns. <laughs> Our charitable Winston. The best we can possibly say is, at least the latter quotation is not quite hate-filled, but merely dismissive and entirely patronising. This is the calibre of person that what they call the greatest ever Britain was. Such was his worldview and sense of justice. <coughs> Sorry. A glimpse into the national chauvinism of the man is even given on another rare occasion of compassion. During the horrors of World War I, he passionately told his fellow MPs, what is going on while we sit here? Nearly 1,000 Englishmen, Britishers, men of our own race are knocked into bundles and bloody rags. Even an apologist for Churchill's racism, Richard Holmes, admits that there is no dying that he mouthed the clichés of eugenics while he was young, that he regarded native peoples as inferior, or that he appealed to racial prejudices in his speeches against Indian self-government. What must be asked of the Churchill apologist mainstream historians, such as Holmes himself, is just how many times one man can have an out-of-context racist or xenophobic comment. Either he is ridiculously unlucky in managing to have words taken out of context to such an extent, or those words are very much in context in keeping with Churchill's character. The reality is, Churchill's regularly published words 
throughout his career, support intolerable views that were used to justify the global exploitation and oppression of the British Empire. In contrast, the BBC's refreshing documentary, When Britain Said No, saw historians make much more honest appraisals of Churchill. These appraisals were entirely in line with the picture being presented here. Firstly, Professor John Charmley stated, Churchill is not fighting a war against fascism. In fact, a lot of Churchill's views in the 1930s were rather sympathetic to fascism. He admired Mussolini. He admired Franco. And at least until 1938, he'd said obliging things about Hitler as well. Indeed, Churchill had openly said he admired Hitler's patriotic achievements and referred to him as an indomitable champion when writing in the Strand magazine in the 1930s. He gushed over Mussolini, to whom he said, if I had been an Italian, I'm sure I would have been entirely with you from the beginning of your victorious struggle against the bestial appetites and passions of Leninism. In the same documentary, Max Hastings challenged the false idea of Churchill as a champion of democracy. He highlighted the simple fact that Churchill's vision of freedom and human rights only extended to the middle and upper classes of Europe. And at that, generally only to the men of Europe. At some points he supported the rights of women to vote, but largely he dismissed them. And when he found a female MP in the House of Commons, he said he felt like uh, she had walked in on him in the bathroom while he was entirely uncovered and had nothing to defend himself, which is an rather, rather odd and crude uh, view of women, I think, uh, and says a lot more about him than anything else. This one there from the woman and the woman and beside the biology of life had committed suicide. I said to Lady Ashton, wasn't it? Yeah. I can't remember. It was. Yeah. Something else he said to Lady Ashton. No, there was another quote. It was either um, it was either attributed to him saying it to the MP um, Bessie. Come on. Braddock. Bessie Braddock um, or Lady Astor. Was, uh, I think it was more Lady likely to be. Uh, I think it was more she likely to be Bessie. I'll give you poison. She said, if I was your wife, I'd take it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, there, was a, there was a different exchange about um, he was drunk in, uh, somewhere and uh, she accused him of being drunk and said, well, you're ugly, uh, but I'll be sober in the morning. Which no, yeah. Isn't a particularly no, witty riposte. No, you're, you're ugly and you'll still be ugly in the morning, but I will be sober. <laughs> and that's, that's frequently quoted as uh, an example of wit. his great sharp wit, uh, <laughs> which I don't think, you know, saying you're ugly to someone is perhaps the wittiest response you can muster. <laughs> but it displays his attitude to, to women quite well. Um, this fact was displayed throughout his entire career that he didn't think democracy was for women, he didn't think democracy was for anyone outside the, the middle and upper classes of, uh, of Europe, essentially. Um, from engineering the Bengal famine that killed millions, to boasting of killing three savages in the Sudan, to his repression of striking workers as well when they were trying to um, collectively demonstrate uh, and bargain for, for better conditions. Of Gandhi, he said he ought to be laying bound in foot of the gates of Delhi, and be trampled on by an enormous element, elephant with the new viceroy seated on his back. <laughs> and, <laughs> well, we don't have any particular love of Gandhi, but it's surprising that... I have a lot of sympathy for that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's quite telling that Churchill wasn't even open to the idea of um, Gandhi, who was actually providing a very easy way out for the British Empire, who were finding it increasingly untenable to control India uh, with a growing liberation movement and Gandhi provides a very conciliatory um, path to maintain bourgeois rule, maintain um, the exploitation of India, but just have it nominally done under Indian self-rule. Uh, but even that was uh, a bit too much for dear old Winston. Furthermore, in a speech to the West Essex Conservative Association, he remarked, it is alarming and also nauseating to see Mr Gandhi a seditious middle temple lawyer, now posing as a fakir, striding half naked up the steps mm. of the vice regal palace. <laughs> Again, no love for Gandhi, but <laughs> it demonstrates Churchill's attitudes just the same. It is interesting to note that not once did Churchill speak so passionately or with such contempt regarding Hitler. Finally, Charmley summed him up as 
the equivalent of Nigel Farage, and we forget because of the myth, someone so far to the right that the next stop was Oswald Mosley in the black shirts. And indeed, as um, we'll talk about a little bit later, um, he actually had uh, someone employed by the, uh, or someone that was involved with the British Union of Fascists as one of his ghostwriters. Um, actually, that leads me on to um, anti Semitism. Um, Churchill was no stranger to anti Semitism to promote his ends either. He characterised the Russian Revolution as a conspiracy of the international jury. <coughs> I think I've heard that somewhere before. And in 1920, he wrote in the Illustrated Sunday Herald that it has been the mainspring of every subversive movement during the 19th century. <coughs> and, at, and now at last, this band of extraordinary personalities from the underworld of the great cities of Europe and America have gripped the Russian people by their heads and have become practically the undisputed masters of that enormous empire. So he was quite in, a, quite in the company of Hitler, Hearst, um, Oswald Mosley and others with his thoughts regarding the international Jewry and Bolshevism. Churchill recommended the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine, although noting that, of course, Palestine is far too small to accommodate more than a fraction of the Jews, nor do the majority of nationalistic Jews wish to go there. He argued that the Jews persecuted in Europe should be allowed and encouraged to emigrate to Palestine not to combat anti-Semitism at home, not to say that Jewish people uh, are welcome, uh, as are any other workers of any you know, faith and colour, to, to live and work with us, but that they should essentially go away, because as is the classic Zionist argument that Jews can never integrate into society, Jews can never be a part of Western society, and so they have to leave and have their own homeland, uh, an entirely racist and anti-Semitic approach the question. Now his own ends were that Zionism, he believed, would weaken Bolshevism because it was in violent contrast to international communism. By 1940 he had to contrast himself from the anti-Semitism of Nazi Germany and he suppressed the publication of an article he had commissioned in 1937 and approved to be published in his own name. This article essentially blamed the Jewish people for the persecution they suffered in Europe and portrayed them as irreconcilably different. Uh, that was the one written by uh, the uh, person from the British Union of Fascists. Uh, and he had no problem with the article in 1937. He tried to get it published. It was only by the time war broke out that he thought, well, maybe these views don't sit quite right at the moment because we're actually at war with these people, so we have to suppress what I said, or what I agreed with. The hatred of the so-called greatest ever Britain for the people of the colonies could only be rivalled by the hatred of the domestic working class. His political career was not lacking in domestic controversies, usually involving violent attacks on the working class. The self-styled man of the people cannot be viewed as anything other than a sworn enemy of the people. For example, whilst Home Secretary in 1911, it fell under his remit to deal with the Liverpool General Transport strike. Desperate for better paying conditions, as well as union recognition, 250,000 people went on strike that August. The 13th of the month became known as Bloody Sunday. Some 80,000 people marched to the city's St George's Hall. An entirely unprovoked attack on the workers by police and shoes. 96 arrests were made and 196 people were hospitalised just for a peaceful demonstration in support of a strike. The workers of Liverpool fought back in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the police. Ever the opportunist, Churchill used these events to give the working class a kicking. 3,500 troops were brought into Liverpool to quell the workers, while at the same time the gunboat HMS Antrim was positioned in the Mersey. It's in response to a strike 3,500 soldiers and a gunboat. Two murders were reported at the hands of the army and at least three other workers were shot. As workers across the country came out in support of the Liverpool strikers, Churchill mobilised over 50,000 troops. Further shootings of workers were reported in Lanelli. This was not the first time Churchill was responsible for such actions. A year prior to these events, he had taken similar steps in Tommy Pandy. <coughs> 
The Cambrian Combine, a collection of local mining companies, had opened a new mine scene in Penny Grade. I apologise for the pronunciation. They ran a short test period with 70 miners in order to decide what the target extraction rate should be. The bosses were unhappy with the rate of extraction of the 70 test workers and accused them of taking it easy. This was a ridiculous accusation given that the men were paid based on amounts extracted rather than an hourly weight. So piece work rather than working by the hour. So if they don't do as much work as possible, they get paid less. On September the 1st, 950 workers at the Eli Pitt turned up for work only to discover they had been locked out. By November, only one of the Cambrian Combine pits remained open. On the 8th of November, a miners' demonstration was attacked by the police. Once again, the would-be warlord had sent in the troops. Again, there was one reported murder of a worker and over 500 casualties. The story was repeated in 1919. This time, Glasgow workers became grated with the brutal Home Secretary. After World War I, workers returned home from conscription in the Imperialist War with the hope of a better life. Having lived through the horrors of the front, however, they returned to unemployment and poverty. A 40-hour strike was called with the demand that workers' hours should be reduced in order to create more job openings and alleviate unemployment. By the 31st of January, there were 60,000 workers on the streets of Glasgow and the red flag flew in the George Square. 14 months following the Great October Socialist Revolution in Russia, the British ruling class greatly feared the power of the workers. Its response was a brutal suppression of the movement. There are a host of arrests, including that of Communist leader Willie Gallagher. Government officials referred to the strike as a Bolshevik uprising, and Churchill acted accordingly. It's like a red rag to a bull rat. He decided to send 10,000 troops to Glasgow to crush the workers. He could never be accused of being even-handed, could he? <laughs> they, were, they were supported by tanks and armed with machine guns. Organising labour, challenging the authority of the state, brought out in Churchill the same aggressive spirit with which the Russian Revolution had once aroused him. Once the barricades were erected, Churchill, of course, knew which side of them he was on. The general strike in 1926 gave Churchill a water fight at home, and the barricades were erected. This strike has been well covered by the Communist Party of Great Britain, Mark Slane's pamphlet, the 1926 British General Strike. For wider context, uh, we encourage you all to, to read this work. Narrowly, looking at Churchill's role in the strike, on 2nd of May, workers refused to print the Daily Mail's anti-worker articles. Can you imagine that in this day and age? Daily Mail articles, uh, Daily Mail workers siding with their fellow workers. We really like their articles, they're good great publishers. <laughs> This infuriated Churchill, uh, stopping the printing of the Daily Mail, who decried outrageous that a great organ of the press has been muzzled by strikers. This he said to fellow ministers, and it was rather clear to them that Churchill was brimming with excitement at the prospect of the battle ahead. A fight with the unions would give Churchill an avenue to pursue his fancy of being a British Mussolini. The strike began the following day, and two days later, a state propaganda newspaper, the British Gazette, was launched, with Churchill as editor. He was given the position by Baldwin, apparently in the context of keeping out of harm's way, for Baldwin confessed he was terrified of what Winston was going to be like. As well as being charged with the state propaganda newspaper, Churchill also confiscated the supply of the trade union congresses, the British worker. Churchill was absolutely certain that no compromise could be made regarding the strikers, he arguably treated them with more contempt than the British imperialists had treated the Germans during the war, in a manner akin to Nazism. He furiously declared, on May the 7th, we are at war. This was a war started by Churchill and company. Soon to be editor of the New Statesman, Kingsley Martin explained, Churchill and other militants in the cabinet were eager for a strike, knowing that they had built a national organisation in the six months' grace won by the subsidy of the mining industry. Churchill himself told me, I asked Winston what he thought of the Samuel Coal Commission. When Winston said that the subsidy had been granted to enable the government to smash the unions, 
my picture of Winston was confirmed. And that's a very, um, very interesting parallel between that and the minor strike of 84-85, uh, in which uh, Thatcher and the Conservative government at the time um, gave overtime essentially to all the um, miners in order to build up such a supply of coal that the government would be able to weather any strike held by the very powerful uh, miners' union at the time that they wanted to smash because they feared its power. And at this point, he actually wanted to, uh, Churchill wanted to enlist the army against the workers, and he had to be talked out of publishing an article calling for such. During the strike, he would refer to the workers as fire and the state as the fire brigade. The only end he was willing to accept was the unconditional surrender of the TUC. Fortunately for him, the TUC and Labour Party leaderships were only too keen to roll over and have their bellies tickled. As Charlie described it, to have written about the TUC leaders as though they were potential Lenins said more about the state of Churchill's imagination than it did about his judgment. <coughs> um, of course, the Soviet Union really embodied everything that Churchill feared and hated in terms of the organised working class that had destroyed the old order and had built a new life for workers. Uh, I mean, we can see, you know, his thoughts and attitudes to the working class very clearly, how he dealt with striking miners, how he considered they had to be smashed, how he recognised that it was a war. And it was a very honest approach. I mean, you know, a lot of people on the left uh, and the right today will not admit that there is a class war, will not, uh, will not admit even that there is a, a ruling class and a working class. Um, but Churchill was quite clear about it, and you know, despite, in contrast to his praise of fascist states of Mussolini, Franco, and Hitler, you know, the Russian Revolution was the most terrifying and detestable thing to him. Of his attempts to strangle the Russian Revolution at birth, De Est sums it up: "It was also Churchill, who, before the dead had been counted from the First World War." who was advocating another war against the Bolsheviks in Russia. Though he preached the principles, seek to avoid war, but should war be the last resort, then wage it vigorously and win, he failed to apply these principles to Russia, against which he most definitely sought to engage war, and not to avoid it. We can explain this double standard with ease. Firstly, it fits entirely with his penchant for discrepancy between word and deed. Secondly, Soviet Russia was the ultimate manifestation of everything he hated and feared in the domestic working class. Bolshevism had paved the way to making his class, the bourgeoisie, history. The Russian Revolution was a living, breathing example to the working class of how to win political power. Absolutely intolerable to a sign of the bourgeoisie. On the other hand, never once did Churchill attempt to strangle a fascist state at birth. But then fascism never represented a threat to his class interests. His aggression against the Soviet Union was an extension of his aggression against the domestic working class. He would later get his chance in Greece, turning on the Greek communists and partisan fighters who had just helped to liberate the country. The British were sent in to help disarm the partisans, they then armed the Nazi collaborators and they fired on unarmed protesters. Churchill considered the influence of the Communist Party within the resistance movement he had backed throughout the war, the National Liberation Front, EAM and EALAS, to have grown stronger than he calculated, sufficient to jeopardise his plan to return the Greek king to power and keep communism at bay. Within days, RF Spitfires and Bue fighters were strafing leftist strongholds as the Battle of Athens, known in Greece as the... Christine? Decembriana. Decembriana, thank you. Began. Fought not between the British and Nazis, but the British alongside Nazis against supporters of the partisans. This response to the 1944 uprising would lead to a bloody and costly civil war. And I can't think of many other better examples of 
the bourgeoisie's attitude to the working class and socialism, but also the bourgeoisie's attitude to fascism and any kind of independence movement. And it shows that they would rather side with Nazis and fascists because they do not represent a threat to their class interests. Nazis and fascism do not do away with the exploitation of man by man. In fact, they increase it in a lot of senses. The naked dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, which Churchill was clearly all in favour of throughout his career of sending the army against workers, of sending the army or starving out native populations that dared challenge the rule of the British Empire. This was the attitude of the ruling class then, and this is the attitude of the ruling class now. Even after the war, the British working class did not accept Churchill. Official history may tell us differently, but in his own time, the people despised him. There is no greater example of the disdain held for him than what transpired whilst campaigning for the 1945 general election in Walthamstow. This event is recalled in the BBC documentary When Britain Said No. Lionel King was a child in the assembled crowd that day. His family were among the tiny pro-Churchill contingency in the audience. He recalls, What stuns me, there are large numbers of people carrying posters proclaiming the merits of Soviet Russia. There were hammers and sickles on banners and pictures of Stalin. The poor chap could hardly make himself heard. <laughs> Churchill's history tells us that he, almost single-handedly, was responsible for defeating Nazism. His far-sightedness and resolutedness saw our country and the world through those darkest hours. But the working people of the time had lived through it and knew the truth. The heroic efforts of the Soviet leadership and people had won the day. Churchill's manoeuvring and refusal to open a second front could not be purged from collective memory quite so quickly. And I'm happy to report that, again, on the 9th of May, Victory Day, celebrations, the uh, Stalin Society laid a wreath at the Soviet War Memorial uh, in the name of the society, um, making clear our respect for the sacrifice of those 27 million Soviet soldiers, citizens, women, children uh, in the fight against Nazi fascism and the leadership and guidance of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Comrade Stalin and all those other communists that recognised the threat that not just capitalism posed to us, uh, but the threat of capitalism um, in its form of fascism. Similarly, Churchill's crimes against the working class before the war were not forgotten. His name had passed down the generations as a brutal class warrior. The war had merely brought a ceasefire between him and the British working class. The ceasefire was now over. As John Charmley describes it, Walthamstow shows something we have forgot, that there is a whole section of the electorate, particularly the working class, particularly the trade union electorate, that never had any time for Churchill. He thinks Walthamstow was an isolated incident, but it was not. It was a general working class revulsion for what Churchill stood for in terms of working class politics. Um, I would like to have said a bit more, uh, but I didn't have time. I mean, there's many other things to go into. Um, I mean, the, the issue of Greece, for example, could have been explored in great depth. Uh, the collaboration, the treachery, the you know, disgusting actions. Uh, as well as his foreign policy in terms of <coughs> his attitude to the Irish and uh, British occupation of Ireland, uh, British occupation of India. You know, he was a British Empire man through and through. And that made hatred of the working class internationally. Um, and so there could be much more gone into, um, particularly his post war role. But I hope that talk gives some overview of his thoughts and attitudes and the way they were informed by class politics. You know, it's not just that he was a racist <coughs> and a nasty chap. You know, there was a reason for his racism, it was a useful tool for him to justify the division and exploitation of the working class. And, you know, it falls down in the face of, you know, his continual opportunism. 
one moment he's he's not so racist, the next moment he's virulently racist. Uh, the reality is all of his thoughts and expressions, his contradictions, serve uh, bourgeois class interests. And that is what is at the heart of the issue. Uh, Winston Churchill was a bourgeois politician through and through. That explains why he was willing to advocate and put in place policies for the exploitation of millions and millions of workers at home and abroad. Why he was willing to send the army to fight striking workers at home. Why he was willing to send the army to fight the Soviet Union and to fight national liberation movements. Um, it explains as well why after the war, the first thing he did, in the conclusion of one of the most destructive, brutal, horrific wars the world has ever seen, Churchill essentially went on a tour to open up the Cold War. And he went to um, colleges in America and many other places to give talks about the Iron Curtain, the Iron Wall between Western Europe and Eastern Europe, the Iron Wall between capitalist Western Europe and socialist Eastern Europe. And he really began his job of, from his experience as a bourgeois journalist, a writer, as well as a politician, of stirring up this hatred and fear of the working class as represented by the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc and encouraged politicians in the West to pursue a much harder line against the socialist worker states. Anyway, that's all I have to say on that now. Sorry, I wasn't uh,